Welcome to today's webinar provided by Solar Plaza as a prequel for our Making Solar Bankable conference, jointly organized with FMO and taking place from 18 to 19 February in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. In the coming hour, we'll learn more uh, about financing solar in emerging markets. My name is Tom van Dorp. I'm working at Solar Plaza since 2010 and currently uh, responsible for, for the event on Solar Plaza's site. I'll be moderating today's session and in a minute I will give you a short introduction of our company Solar Plaza and, and the upcoming event. But first I uh, want to give you a quick idea uh, of today's agenda and uh, what to expect. Um, so we'll start with a quick introduction from my side. Our speakers of today are Thierry Leper, co-founder and chairman of Solar Direct and Manuel Cabrerizov, Managing Director of Voltic. Cherry will try to answer the question if developing solar in emerging market is competitive, and he will share his vision on the future of financing solar energy projects. Manuel will run, will run you through the different financial structures applicable for solar in emerging markets, and we will end the session with a Q&A. The session is expected to come to an end in about uh, one hour. Some practical notes. The presentations will be made available afterwards, you will receive an email within a couple of days uh, from now with a link to the presentations. You can ask questions at any point throughout the webinar via the chat box. There will be time for a couple of questions after every speech and in the panel discussion at the end of the webinar we will address further questions. If you have any technical problems, don't hesitate to drop your questions in the chat box. There is a technical support desk available on our site who will try to help you solve the problems immediately. To give you an idea about who is with you in this virtual conference room, we have composed a sheet with the background of the attendees of today's webinar. Would you over 300 uh, others have signed up to join the session? And uh, you can see here the country of residence, so we see a, Europe well present, but also a lot of presence from North America, Afri Africa and Asia. The background of the attendees and, and its level is, is quite senior. As you can see, uh, we have a high percentage of CEOs and presidents here in the room. That means it's a topic that is, uh, is high interest. Um, quickly about uh, Solar Plaza. Um, since we've reached you with the promotion of this webinar, I assume you all know Solar Plaza, but still for the people who are not completely aware of our activities, a short introduction. We were a global information platform for the solar industry founded in 2004. Our mission uh, is empowering professionals in solar business development by building the most valuable solar network. And we do this mostly through conferences and trade missions, of uh, which we have organized more than 70 in the, in the past uh, 10 years. And especially in the last years, we've been growing significantly and fast. Um, a couple of the events that are upcoming, of course, I, I touched already on the Making Solar Bankable event, where this webinar is attached to. Other events that we're organizing is, is one, for example, on solar and storage. Uh, we're gonna, so you're going to see more storage events from our sites in the coming year. Uh, already three are scheduled. Um, our asset management conference in North America, one of the largest we organize and certainly the largest in North America. And also another event in South Africa focusing on solar finance solutions. But you will hear more of us uh, soon about events in Argentina and Uruguay, Vietnam and Thailand and uh, several other places around the world. About FMO, our partner in organizing this uh, this whole event, um, the vision of, uh, of FMO is to empower entrepreneurs to build a better world. Uh, it's the Dutch Development Bank, as you uh, all probably know. Uh, they're established in 1970 and uh, they have an investment portfolio of over 8 billion euros and are spanning 85 plus countries uh, and are having an AAA rating from Fitch and an AA plus rating from Standard & Poor's. The, just to introduce you into the event briefly, um, this is a joint event organized by Solar Plaza and FMO, making solar bankable in emerging markets. And the idea was initiated by FMO, and um, I, we think we're going to be strong partners since Solar Plaza has a very strong international PV network, and FMO, of course, has a very strong international banking network. So that overlap uh, leads to this event. Uh, what we target um, to unlock finance uh, for new product development in, in emerging markets specifically. When we talk about emerging markets, we talk about Asia, Africa, and Latin America in, in this specific event. Just a rough program overview to, to introduce you to that. Um, on the 17th of February, we already start with a pre-conference networking drink, accessible for everybody that registers for the conference, and an informal pre-conference get-together. On the 18th of February, you have a, a full conference day. Um, with uh, several sessions um, and I want to highlight one of them which is the, the fourth session which is a solar shark tank 
you might have heard of the concept, but it's uh, it's a pitch competition uh, where we have several pitches being uh, being rewarded um, by a jury um, together with access uh, access. This is organized with FMO. The 19th of February is the closing day where we have in-depth workshop sessions and uh, a couple of closing keynotes uh, and an afternoon with networking and leisure. Uh, more, of course, can be found on the, on the website of the event, uh, www.makingsolarbankable.com. Just a quick overview of some speakers. Um, quite some well-known names already have been confirmed, including, of course, the CEO and, and Chief Investment Officer of, of FMO, um, Nano Kleiterp and Linda Bruchhuizen, but also high-level executives from other development banks from who we have the support and keynote speakers from, from the industry and, and the banking uh, segment. Um, so here, some more. You can, of course, find all the details on the website. So I'm not going to bother you much longer with this now. Um, event is not possible without sponsors. Uh, we had the support of various uh, development banks uh, like DEG, ProParco, African Finance Corporation, and IFC, um, and a lot of solar industry players, including uh, today's speakers from Solar Direct and then Voltic. Um, the first speaker that I'd like to introduce you with, uh, to you is Thierry Leperc. He's a co-founder and chairman of Solar Direct, and uh, Thierry has been a speaker in various events. Um, and since they have been uh, acquired by Engie, they are capable to much bigger things. As at least that's what he shared with me already. We're going to hear more from him uh, in his presentation. Uh, Thierry, I want to give you the word. Um, and thanks, I'm going to make you the presenter and, of this. Uh, and thanks to everyone. Uh, for joining this this webinar, I think uh, you're having a, a, a very uh, timely uh, initiative, which is uh, um, which coincides with uh, lots of events. Um, first, um, and I'm going to develop on, on these and these various uh, and this coincidence. Uh, first, uh, to say that <clears throat> indeed solar now is competitive, and I, we keep repeating it, but uh, that's that's a game changer. And what we see right at the same time is a takeoff uh, of, uh, of markets in emerging and frontier countries. What we see as well, and you just mentioned it, uh, is something new, is that large utilities, and NG, uh, to those who are not familiar with, uh, with it, is a, is a large, uh, uh, actually is the largest IPP in the world, 2% of global power production, 115 gigawatts, 150,000 people in 70 countries. Uh, which today has decided to move out of uh, coal and to a certain extent as well other uh, uh, other fossil uh, renew, uh, energies and which is now moving aggressively into into solar and with a very big ambition and we, we at Solar Direct joined the, the group uh, uh, a couple of months ago uh, and to embody that um, that ambition and last but not least and I'll mention that uh, we just had a very important conference in Paris, which ended a couple of days ago, and which is making history uh, because uh, for the first time, solar has been taking a centerpiece with the announcement of the International Solar uh, <coughs> Alliance. So, if I get to uh, the depth and the matter of what uh, my message is today, is that uh, we have a paradigm shift, which is both uh, uh, the issue of how to scale up uh, massively what is today the uh, basically the cheapest form of energy and is now becoming mainstream and also addressing these complicated issues of how do you develop and, and fund projects in frontier countries uh, or more countries that have or, uh, that are now becoming candidates for, 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 for development in solar and I will share some of our experience at Solar Direct. Um, <clears throat> but first um, you know a few a few key figures you have here on the uh, right-hand side figures that everyone is uh, fully aware of. Interestingly enough, these figures date back for a few few months back, and and you see the estimates by IHS for 2015 at 52.8 gigawatts. Now we're getting closer to 60 gigawatts, which means that what is a constant in this industry is that the un permanent underestimation of volumes. And what we have seen over the last couple of years, which is now taking shape massively, is that. Uh, those emerging in frontier markets uh, in Asia and Africa and, uh, and most importantly uh, uh, as well in Latin America are, are taking off and the reason for that is precisely what you see on the left hand side on the right hand side 
uh, is that solar uh, has uh, fully become competitive. We're talking about uh, biddings because that's the, the way to, to measure the, the <coughs> competitiveness of solar in the, in the sharpest way, which has which are as low as $50 in, uh, per megawatt hour in some, um, in some geographies, which means that uh, uh, solar roughly now is, uh, is uh, at the level of, of coal, uh, better than new coal, uh, better than uh, new gas in most geographies as well, and they're competing head-on with other energy sources. So what the, the, the big shift that we are seeing today, which is the, uh, the the, the first most important paradigm, solar is cheaper than the rest and it's going to get cheaper. Uh, I like to, t to say that uh, at one point uh, solar is, uh, is nearly free uh, and, it's, uh, and, and then the issue is not, not necessarily to generate free power but uh, to, to make sure that it is uh, uh, developed at scale and, uh, and integrated into the grid and, and served to, to end consumers. Now, if we look at uh, what uh, it yields in terms of positioning of solar prices, and this is our experience. These are uh, uh, six countries where Solar Direct has uh, uh, developed projects or, or participated in, in, in biddings. And what we see today is that, uh, uh, well, the USA being a bit special with the, the assistance of the ITC, but we've seen projects at below $40. In the case of France, we're now uh, uh, below uh, 65 euros per megawatt hour. That's the 75 dollar mark that has already been crossed, which means that solar is already half the price of new nuclear and, and significantly cheaper than gas. Uh, if we go to India, and, uh, and there was again a tender allocated today uh, at, a, uh, at extremely competitive rates, which show that solar PV uh, is now competing head-on with uh, uh, new coal and gas as well, and, and in the case of South Africa, to give it an, another example, uh, solar PV is far cheaper than, than new coal, especially those two, uh, new, um, two coal fire plants which are now being connected to the Great Midupi and Kusiri. The message behind that is that not only is solar uh, cheaper, but solar is as, as well less risky than other asset classes, and the fact that we've crossed these milestones of cheaper of solar being cheaper than alternatives is not only uh, opening up for larger volumes, it's also changing the dynamics of risk. And whether you have um, the traditional business models of uh, fit-in tariffs or, or, or tenders, or newer business models of PPAs or market uh, or self-consumption or sale to the, to the wholesale power markets, actually a variety of new business models emerging. Uh, <clears throat> what you're seeing today is that as an investment class, an investment proposal and, and a, as an asset class, solar power uh, infrastructures are becoming extremely attractive because they're again uh, generating a commodity which is power uh, sustainably and durably so at prices which are lower than the, than the the rest of uh, uh, other uh, energy sources. Now, the consequence of that is well documented. You have here figures that map the uh, increase of markets in in in, in some of these uh, emerging regions. <clears throat> the most striking being India. I must say though that if you look at the figures, all these figures are, are figures by IHS. Uh, they show uh, the uh, the Indian power solar power market at nine gigawatts by uh, 2019. There are other forecasts today that put it at uh, actually two or three times that level, uh, especially if the uh, 100 gigawatt by, by 2022 objective is, is to be met. And we are quite confident seeing the amazing level of interest and competition uh, which is uh, now unfolding in India that these numbers will, will be extended. Now we have uh, the same kind of boom uh, under uh, underway in, in Latin America and Africa and the Middle East as well. Obviously, all of this is uh, raising questions just as much as uh, showing an opportunity. The question is, where is all the money going to come from? And if you were talking about uh, bringing the, uh, then again, uh, 100 gigawatts of solar into India uh, to ramp up massively in Africa and, 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 and traditionally non-bankable countries uh, in, in Africa and, and to a certain extent in Latin America, the, the key is um, <clears throat> how is it all going to happen? Now, a bit of uh, sharing uh, 
of our experience at Sora Direct and I'll focus on a, on a few on a few markets. Uh, first and foremost, then again, the fact that we are able to generate power significantly less uh, at a very attractive price in Chile. Let's focus on Chile for a while. Uh, <clears throat> has made it possible for us to attract financing uh, over a hundred million dollar uh, financing for our one of our first projects that is presently under construction north of Santiago uh, and in this case was one of those projects which could be financed to by uh, uh, with a business model which is direct selling power directly onto the uh, onto the power grid uh, with a very low uh, hurdle rate or low uh, a stress rate, if I may say, the, the the capacity that we've had in this project to structure uh, financing with um, a low uh, uh, potential market price is something that has attracted trust from 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 the bankers who've taken the uh, as as always a very very conservative case uh, uh, options in their in in their banking cases. So what we have. In Chile, is the capacity that our, our capacity was to finance uh, uh, over 17 years for 70 percent of the financing of of uh, of this uh, 100 million dollar project, which uh, uh, shows that uh, solar has really has shifted from uh, from a fit and tariff or government driven thing to a market driven thing, and and this um, has been a, a milestone. Obviously, what, now what we're seeing in Chile. Uh, is uh, since power prices are still going down, uh, is the shift towards uh, alternative uh, uh, business models such as uh, PPAs. But what remains to be seen is that the appetite is there, and solar as an asset class is in, is, uh, is is becoming much larger. Another interesting example is India. Uh, <coughs> in India, <coughs> we finance about. Um, close to 200 megawatts of projects so far uh, which are either built or under construction and in this case what we've seen is uh, uh, <clears throat> twofold uh, an interesting situation uh, a very strong capacity of local banks to finance projects in Chile I didn't mention it but it was mostly multi multilateral banks uh, um, and uh, a more challenging environment uh, I must say to finance equity and, and this is obviously something that will need to be addressed in the future. Equity is a fundamental, uh, 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 I think, hole today in, in most of those financings, but uh, um, is, is, is coming along. Uh, has been easier for us in, in a country like South Africa, where we, uh, South Africa has the advantage of having some large uh, institutional investors. Uh, we finance our projects with the likes of Old Mutual, which is the largest insurer in the country. And, and, and in this case, we've had the experience of um, uh, uh, a maturing market. What is quite interesting in the case of South Africa, and we've seen in other geographies, but South Africa is a very good example, is that the first projects that were financed just five years ago commanded 20% plus uh, um, returns of investment. And, and uh, in the latest rounds, notwithstanding what happened in the, in the stock, in the, the, in the, in the uh, with uh, with the South African rand a couple of uh, in the last couple of weeks or, or so, but if we if we take the situation uh, for for 2015 at large, what we've seen is a much lower expectations by investors, which means that uh, we've seen a maturing of investors uh, from what is already uh, a market which is taking shape because uh, over a, a gigawatt of solar has been installed. Now, if we take the perspective of countries which are not in this uh, on this map and which we are exploring at the moment, Solar Direct is uh, is developing and, and preparing construction of projects in such places like uh, Egypt, Senegal, uh, Namibia, uh, Jordan. Peru and uh, uh, Mexico and a few others, aside from those countries that you see on the map. And the message behind that is that uh, the key in order to, uh, the first step in order to make those uh, those uh, projects and, and those countries bankable is to have a thorough review of regulations. And what is interesting in some of these markets, and we've seen that with uh, in, the, in the Middle East with the European, uh, the BRD and, and with the uh, IDB in, 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 in Latin America is multilateral institutions such as FMO as well uh, working together with governments 
trying to uh, change regulations or enforce new regulations so that uh, investor security is, is, is assured. If we have a super competitive solar generation uh, capacity, this is one thing. Now, this will only happen if, as uh, the example I was giving uh, on South Africa, if the uh, re return expectations go down, if the risk profile of the installations is perceived as relatively limited. And the, the big challenge today is to to implement that in those frontier markets of Africa, as I was mentioning, and uh, and some others. And what we're seeing is, uh, uh, as I've mentioned, a, a very interesting move from from uh, from governments working with uh, multilateral institutions trying to to put together the right framework. And at the same time, it's important, and that this is the thing that we've benefited from in the, in, the, in Africa, to have some pioneering financial institutions which are uh, <clears throat> keen to. Um, to invest in new markets, provided obviously they get uh, satisfactory returns, but pave the way for, 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 for larger investors. So what we're seeing right now is uh, these, this movement uh, ratcheting up uh, massively with, the, uh, uh, with this event, which uh, uh, we were fortu very fortunate sorry, to, be, to be part of. Uh, and uh, I, I want really to insist on what uh, happened last week in Paris, or last two weeks, because it's not only a big event with a, 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 a rather obscure uh, agreement being signed by 195 countries, it's, uh, uh, it's a new logic which is emerging. No longer the logic of climate uh, fighting against climate change through uh, uh, taxation, carbon uh, prices and, and, and subsidies, it's part of that, but it's not only uh, technology has, has been uh, put forward by, by uh, for instance, Bill Gates and some of his friends, uh, but something totally different, which we as uh, solar companies are representing, which is investment. Investment, massive investment, scaling up investment uh, for, uh, for uh, solar installations, uh, uh, and to make sure that what is already competitive, what is already mastered from a technology standpoint, if you, we talk about solar, which is going to be need to be mastered if we talk about uh, storage, demand response, transmission, which needs to, uh, to, to, to be there to make sure that the, these uh, very high emissions in solar are indeed implemented. But most importantly, what we have is a framework being created with the realization by governments that they have a role to play, and that role there again is not to subsidize anything, but to create the right framework. And uh, so we worked for uh, over a year and uh, with uh, with uh, with governments and and uh, and um, and as well uh, some inter international uh, uh, agencies and obviously uh, private sector companies such as uh, and and for first and foremost the. The, um, the energy group uh, to launch what was uh, launched effectively on the 30th of November in Paris just two weeks ago, uh, which was uh, uh, two things. This International Solar Alliance, as you see the picture of President Hollande and, and, and Prime Minister Modi, uh, uh, Secretary General, uh, General Ban Ki-moon was also speaking, uh, <coughs> announcing this ambition to mobilize one trillion dollars by 2030 on solar projects, and in order to do that, not there again through subsidies, but by establishing the right legal and regulatory framework, working with multilaterals in order to get there. Simultaneously, and that was a very strong moment, uh, aside uh, uh, on the stage was also uh, speaking Jean Mestralet, the CEO of, uh, of Engie, on behalf of the private sector and sending a very strong message and saying we uh, as a private sector have uh, uh, heard the, uh, the the call to invest one trillion dollars and we're going to answer that call and it was a very strong moment when Jean Mestalé said we as the private sector uh, expect to shoulder over 70 percent uh, of, of that and possibly more uh, still 700 billion and uh, and and to mobilize uh, the private sector in what has been created what uh, this uh, this new uh, organization which has uh, started, which is uh, called the Terawatt Initiative, which is bringing together uh, energy companies, uh, developers, project developers, uh, 
uh, banks, investors, uh, we have the likes of BlackRock, uh, AXA, BNP Paribas and some others, trade associations, the, the, the World Global, the Global Solar Council and which is bringing together the large uh, uh, solar associations coming together. And what we have here, and then again I'm going to take this occasion to invite every listener to this, uh, to this show to join us. Uh, we have a website, uh, Tarawat Initiative. Sorry, Tom, I'm, I'm advertising a bit this, this initiative, but I think it's really, it's a non-profit initiative aiming at uh, uh, changing the rules by, by, by working with those governments to establish the right uh, level playing field for solar investment. And uh, what we have ahead of us is an incredible opportunity to shape regulation in conjunction with local governments, uh, with national governments and, uh, and, uh, and international uh, institutions. So this is, in our opinion, the game changer that we were all expecting in solar is that we are moving from being uh, a sideshow to being the central show. And uh, if I want just to, to, to summarize what uh, we have today, the lesson of financing projects uh, and how to scale them up and, and to bring them into the frontier market is that we need to have to establish cooperation between industry players and that the, the, the new bodies that are being s uh, set up for, for this cooperation and, and Solar Prize is contributing to that in all with all its, its, its conferences uh, on all these subjects all over the world uh, is, is, is now in force and we have now the tools to, to do it to ramp up and I would sum up uh, this, uh, this ambition saying we can and should and will raise uh, this one trillion dollars for, for, for solar projects in, in <clears throat> And, and meet the, the expectations of, uh, of Prime Minister Modi and, and, and the 120 countries that uh, participate in the Solar Alliance. And that adds Thanks up my lot. presentation. <laughs> Thanks a lot, uh, Thierry. Um, a couple of questions uh, that I want to, to address to you um, uh, that are more, a little bit more practical. A lot of questions um, from different uh, nature. Uh, well, one of them is how can you manage the currency risk in emerging markets? How, how is that for, for Solar Direct? How, you deal, how do you deal with these kind of issues? That's a very important one. Uh, first, uh, you want to avoid currency mismatch and financing in dollars of uh, projects that generate uh, revenues in other currencies is not a wise thing to do. So we've avoided it uh, uh, systematically. Some people prefer to go for dollar financing with uh, swaps. Uh, we are keener to say uh, uh, that ultimately currency risks need to be taken and what we need to do with uh, pension funds and, and these other risk adverse uh, investors is to tell them that ultimately currency risk over a long period of time uh, can be basically erased with solar installations because if you have a devaluation of a currency over time you will manage to have a, 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 a price increases so the, either the cash flows will increase. So, so our vision is on the debt side we don't take any uh, exposure uh, through, through risk but on the equity side uh, you need to take that risk, uh, but it can be evened out if you are a long-term investor. Thanks uh, for that. Another question, uh, more related to India specifically, if you have a tariff below 7 cents per kilowatt hour, um, how are you able to make a profit? What is the financial model behind that? Yeah, fin I guess I, I didn't get the end of your question. The financial logic of uh, now it's true that we what we've seen in India in the last couple of uh, 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 a couple of uh, weeks and months is is very low uh, low bidding and then we, and the landmark 4.63 rupees per kilowatt hour which, which was won by by Senate Edison a couple of uh, weeks ago uh, certainly made headlines and lots of people are wondering how do you make an you make money on that. Now the recipe is always the same. You need to industrial reduce your 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 EPC uh, development costs, but there's a limit to what you can do in, on this side. And the other one is financing costs. And and, and it's true that India has uh, had some lower interest rates uh, recently, so there has been able uh, a possibility to reduce uh, to reduce financing costs. Ultimately, our very strong conviction is that selling power 
as in the case of India, at fixed prices in a very high inflation country at such a low level uh, leaves a lot of money on the table. So the best approach, in our opinion, is to switch, probably will be to switch from, from selling power at fixed price to uh, public of takers uh, for 25 years to uh, uh, maybe shorter term sell at uh, more or less inflation adjusted rates which r makes it possible to for investors to capture more value but what we've seen so far is probably uh, I would say very stretched models for certain players which have been trying to buy to buy market share but then again it's the sense of history so nobody could uh, it would be unreasonable to criticize them Right. Another question, a uh, we'll little bit back to the currency uh, hedging. How do you handle swaps in relation to revenues in local currency in the event uh, you have funding in US dollars? Well, first, <laughs> as, as far as we con we're concerned, it's a, we don't do it. Uh, we prefer to have local financing, especially as debt financing is widely available in some countries. Uh, that's certainly the case of India, in the case of South Africa, uh, Chile, and other Latin American countries as well. Even though most of the, f uh, but the, but in this case, in the, as the case in Chile, the, the your PPA is in dollars, so so it's you don't have a currency this much if you had that in dollars. Um, so it's uh, there again. It's it's much better not to 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 try to uh, to avoid this risk and to confront it if you are an equity investor. At the same time, not to take it at all. Uh, and, and the depth of if you're if you're if you when it comes to that, and and it's uh, and it's true that if you go to African countries like uh, for example Senegal or Namibia or or, or, or Ghana to, to take another example Ghana is an interesting situation because it has its own currency which is not the case of of Namibia whose currency is back to the rand and and and, and Senegal's which is back to the euro, but the uh, what we have in the case of, of uh, uh, when you get to those countries that have a, a very small currency, if I can quote, quote, quote that, uh, and very few, very shallow capital markets or no capital markets uh, uh, for that matter, you're much better off uh, uh, having everything in dollars, which is, by the way, the way they're, they're structuring projects in Ghana, for instance, with the contracts that are in, in dollars. Thanks a lot, Jerry. There are plenty more questions, and I, I would ask the audience also to keep asking your questions. We will have more time to address a couple of questions also specifically to Jerry um, at the end of the session. So if you address a question, just indicate to who you want to address it, and we try to deal with them. Uh, Jerry, I want to thank you for, for your uh, amazing contribution. It's always inspiring to, to listen to you, okay. and uh, we're going to hear more of you, of course, uh, uh, on the event itself uh, uh, in, in February. Um, so looking forward to that as well. Um, and thanks for now. I'm going to uh, introduce uh, the next speaker um, to you all, uh, which is uh, Manuel Cabrerizo. He is the managing director of, of Voltic, uh, a company active uh, for uh, basically all over the world, but especially in emerging markets like Chile, uh, where they've done a lot of, uh, a lot of projects uh, already. And hey, uh, everyone. Um, the purpose of this presentation is to uh, show um, Baltic's experience in many markets, in many projects, uh, as to how to apply to make uh, solar projects bankable, specifically for emerging markets. A word about Voltic, uh, we are advisors, entirely independent. We don't play on the equity market, we don't play in the financial market. Uh, we are advisors who help our clients in arranging and structuring equity and debt. We buy and sell projects for our clients, uh, do due diligence, uh, arrange financing packages, project finance for uh, our clients, and uh, deal with all the commercial contracts around it. EPC, O&M, PPAs, arrange for insurance, uh, all the structuring and arranging required for these kind of projects. We only do renewables and transmission, um, so it's a pure play. We're entirely independent, again, so we're not attached to any equity house, any investment bank, uh, nothing. It's independent advice all the time, and we are very discreet in the sense that uh, we rarely publicize our transactions, and we are uh, we tend to, uh, to do a very efficient uh, execution. Um, 
So what follows now is, uh, as I said, the experience we have been able to gather over time and uh, exposure in many projects in many countries. Um, what this slide is actually describing is the current uh, situation, the global push for green, we've titled it. Um, it is hard to imagine a better scenario for any sector anywhere in the world than we have now for solar. We have the first element is that uh, mature markets have provided the growing ground for uh, PV to actually take off uh, in terms of achieving the critical size in order to achieve the, uh, the uh, competitive levelized cost of energy as Thierry was uh, discussing in the previous presentation. We do have the political pressure. We have had world leaders telling that uh, that this is important, environmental matters are important. We had uh, President Obama's plea, we had the Pope Francis uh, with the encyclical for the first time in history uh, dealing with environmental matters. We had uh, two weeks ago Beijing in red alert. We also had the COP21 conference in Paris where governments and corporates and everyone around the world was focusing on this problem. So the, the, the situation is actually extremely favorable for any sector uh, compared to for the sector compared to any other so that leads to an enormous potential in emerging markets that is where the growth is going to be uh, for the sector in particular not least because the per capita power consumption is going to multiply by many times current levels in the coming decades and the issue remains with the funding in where as Thierry was saying uh, where is the money going to come from now, what we see as key uh, factors for the development of that funding uh, going forward is uh, stable regulation, is that in many of these countries, the capital markets are simply not there, and there are significant currency and country risk issues associated to this. Around, uh, on the, on the right-hand side, you can see the graphs as, uh, that show the, the evolution over time. Um, we, this is utility scale, by the way, this is not residential. Uh, we can see uh, in the Asian graph, for example, the peak in 2012, that response to robust investment activity in China, where $57 billion between debt and equity was invested in Chinese renewable energy that year. Uh, in Africa, we see the similar peak in 2012 due to financial close of all the 28 projects under the REI PPP bid window one in November 2012. And together, all these projects raised about $5.7 billion. Um, we do, however, think that this volatility will tend to stabilize as the number of deals increases and the average size is gradually reduced. Um, in order to focus the discussion, we are looking, we have segmented the market, uh, which is basically cutting the kind of transactions between contracted and merchant deals. Contracted deals would be those that have revenues uh, uh, sold, uh, power generated by the project sold under PPAs or feeding tariff systems over the longer run, so that there's, uh, there's, there's no or limited price risk. Uh, merchant deals are those that take full volumetric risk and full price risk. And horizontally, we have split them in hard currency and local currency denominated revenue. Um, the reason for the uh, for the animal code is uh, the cow is an easygoing, peaceful animal, uh, meaning you can get rarely can you get hurt in a contracted deal uh, on, you know, denominated in hard currency. The hawk is the merchant hard currency. Uh, this is an opportunistic, uh, aggressive profile. The elephant is a contracted deal in local currency, which is looks safe. Uh, but at the same time it's impressive, so can turn nasty, uh, but doesn't look as if it could. And then the wild card is a merchant local currency, which is the unicorn. Uh, we've never seen this, some people claim to have seen it, but uh, we haven't actually seen uh, deals in, on a merchant basis in local currency. So what we're going to do now is we're going to discuss each of these boxes, each of these kinds of transactions from both the debt and the equity angle. For contracted hard currency deals, the cows, on the debt side, what we have is everybody playing. We have commercial banks, we have DFIs, we have multilaterals, capital markets, everything, right? The typical structure is a feeding tariff, uh, 
is a feeding tariff uh, or a long-term PPA for a long-term financing package. Um, here we have typically no recourse, it's a syndicated loan. We have uh, some project bonds, but they are less common. And uh, we see, uh, sometimes we also see institutional investors aggregating their debt into portfolios and financing projects uh, that are rated. Probably not individually, but aggregating in portfolios. Um, at the bottom, we have an example of uh, a deal in the United Arab Emirates on the basis of the 25-year PPA with the uh, Dubai Energy and Water Authority. Uh, how does the equity side look like in contracted hard currency deals? Again, multi multiple players, everybody's there. Um, we see incumbent investors taking majorities, uh, passive investors are willing to take minorities. Large players of strategics may do all equity deals here uh, because they can uh, they can take the leverage at the holding level. They can do bag leverage. Um, another significant trend we see here is that yield costs that were kind of kind of uh, falling from grace after uh, a very uh, say flourishing phase, uh, we think will be back because of the sheer amount of liquidity in the uh, in the markets. Um, we do have uh, institutional investors requiring large equity tickets in the region of you know higher than 100 or 200 million dollars. They do prefer strategic partners with a deep understanding of local markets, so they very seldom will go alone. And uh, we also see platforms use this as aggregation instruments to achieve minimum size and scalability. Uh, in fact, but as a for example, this is uh, the two major Canadian pension funds, PSP and Ontario Teachers, investing in a platform, Cubico, uh, created by a leading global lender, Santander. Uh, the purpose of this is to just, just get together and uh, achieve uh, size. Uh, at the bottom of that page, you can see another example of T-Solar selling to Soviet um, a share in the, uh, in the Peruvian project. Uh, looking at the Hawks, merchant deals and hard currency debt side, yet we see a, a, a serious reduction in the number of players. Not everybody's playing here. Commercial banks are involved, uh, not all of them, of course. DFIs are, multilaterals are, ECAs are. Here we have project finance with high uh, DSCR levels. What we have here is that they need to ensure sustainability of the repayment in volatile price scenarios. So that's why they, they, they tend to oversize the, the cover ratios. Structures, are they need to control those risks, uh, and they tend to reduce tenor basically by introducing forward-looking covenants and uh, cash sweeps that effectively cut the term. And we also find uh, that the term issue in, in price volatility scenarios is often uh, is often addressed by offering mini perm structures, soft or mini perm structures that go two or three years into the operating phase, so COD plus two, COD plus three, uh, with a big balloon at the end and often so taking large refinancing risk uh, over the longer term. Uh, as an example, we are mentioning here the Labyrintho project. Uh, this is actually a vaulted deal. We, uh, we did for uh, EDF, Energie Nouvelle, and Marabeni in Chile. Uh, this is uh, non-recourse uh, term money. This is not a mini perm. This is a full merchant, full TANA uh, project financing deal. It's probably the largest PV plant in the Southern Hemisphere and the, and the largest merchant PV transaction. And it's the first one with no multilaterals involved, only with commercial lenders. Equity uh, on merchant uh, hard currency deals, again, reduced number of players. The problem here is that investors are obviously not willing to take uh, regulatory risk after the experience. They burn the fingers in feeding tariffs in material markets like uh, Spain, for example. Uh, what this means is that, in general, investors are very much aware of non-sustainable incentive mechanisms. So markets not displaying this kind of risk are certainly winners going forward. For now, uh, investors are taking uh, are taking part merchant risk uh, 
full Merton deals are still a rarity, uh, like the one we just mentioned of the EDF EN. Um, and we do also see that uh, most aggressive sponsors do use merchant transactions to get uh, one step forward. Most of the most of the equity investors cannot take a merchant project off the ground with lenders, but those who can actually enjoy a significant advantage because. Uh, in order to get the financing together, they do not have to turn to off-takers to secure the revenue that banks actually require to be uh, less volatile, and effectively they gain a, a significant uh, bargaining power towards off-takers when the projects actually get constructed or get in on stream. Um, another trend we also see here is that uh, incorporating renewables to the mix actually reduces the pool price. This is called the green paradox, because the more renewables you actually include in any in any wholesale market, uh, the more conventionals, which are price setters, of course, but are more expensive, as Thierry was arguing before, are displaced. So in an, in an entirely renewable, in an extreme, in an entirely renewable pool market, uh, you would have significantly lower prices. So um, this is uh, something that, uh, that in merchant scenarios is probably hitting equity players hardest. But an example of uh, an equity transaction is uh, San Edison selling to Echo Solar earlier this year uh, a participation, a minority participation in a fully merchant project in the, in the Chile and Northern system. Elephants, these are the contracted deals in local currency. Um, again, very few players here. We do see traditional project finance structures. Uh, tenors are variable. It's very seldom that you get uh, full uh, time money. Uh, we have seen actually uh, diversification through the first uh, capital market uh, bonds. Um, these are typically high yield bonds targeted at incumbent investors or benefiting from excess liquidity situations and then targeted to the wider public. Um, South Africa and India are, are the obviously at the forefront as diversified because they have multilaterals, ECAs, commercial lenders and capital markets at play in, in, their, in, their local, in the local uh, markets, so it's, it's a lot wider. Brazil here is is kind of a is kind of the exceptional uh, situation because of the um, of this specific role BNDS is playing there under limitations in terms of you know a, a swelling balance sheet of BNDS is certainly now calling for less leverage uh, they can afford to contribute less leverage to uh, to each project uh, and those limitations actually um, you know it. Are, are, are calling for the creation of a new bond market to fill in that gap that BNDS cannot afford to finance anymore. So there's a question mark a lot around the subsidizing interest rates that, BN, that role that BNDS is playing uh, that will have to be uh, considered under the uh, entire political situation in, in Brazil. Um, as an example, we have Taos Riviere, uh, Soitec. This is the, the, the green bond uh, that was placed with South African institutional investors. This is a targeted bond placed, uh, placed directly and, uh, and is, is not directed to the wider public. Um, equity for contracted local currency deals. Um, again, limited number of players. Um, Currency is currency risk is the issue. Um, of course, there's a diversification strategy for equity investors, and you know, investing in many countries at the same time is a kind of a natural hedge, of course. So they don't take. They, there are many investors that actually don't need to hedge the currency risk at project level, but they either do it by diversifying or they do it at a higher level when aggregating their total exposure to any one currency, they hedge part of that position rather than each individual investment in each of the projects they're in. Um, the other advantage they have is that when, when they're strategics, they have very long-term uh, investment horizons, 20, 25, 30 years, 
and in that time you obviously take a very long term view so you can afford several downturns and upturns in the exchange rate cycle. Uh, but they do have one important feature, those who take currency risk, which is that they require inflation protection. We do see at the same time growing interest from local financial investors because of these currency issues. So, you know, any exposure to any particular currency is less important if you are a local investor than if you, than if you are a non-resident investor. And that means that investors, international investors, are implicitly accepting and there is a growing universe of alternative investors and they have to take on more risk. As examples, uh, as a case study and underneath, we have uh, Sun Edison uh, buying from uh, Biotin Energy uh, these, uh, ten, these two uh, farms in concurrencies and areas. On the right hand side, bottom right, you see uh, the price evolution achieved by the South African um, South African uh, Windows 1, 2, 3 programs. Uh, in terms of uh, our conclusion, um, we say that the current situation is obviously demand for solar funding is set to expand dramatically globally. We see the political pressure, we see the cost is there, the cost advantage is there. We also see there's a huge amount of liquidity. Uh, central banks of, of major economies are uh, in a, in a massively expansive uh, monetary policy and that is that is providing liquidity all over the world for everything but not enough of that liquidity is, is, is flowing to, through to the renewable sector and we also have uh, an, a significant uh, turn in the utility model we see the reinvented green utility model we see um, that uh, they're attracting cheap funding at corporate level and deploying it worldwide, including emerging markets. We see German utilities announcing that they are splitting their conventional, op their conventional operations to focus on renewables. We see Spanish utilities moving very aggressively into solar, both residential and utility scale. We see Italian utilities doing all equity deals in emerging markets, thanks to cheap corporate borrowing. Uh, and that is the forefront. That is where we see people using their corporate strengths to actually um, escape that uh, narrow uh, liquidity uh, provision by, uh, by traditional lenders and equity investors. Now, the trends we see for uh, solar projects going forward, um, this situation as it is now cannot last. We cannot have on the one hand side a lot of liquidity being poured by central banks into the markets. On the other hand, solar markets demanding more investment and more funding um, and more financing and traditional players channeling just a small fraction of that liquidity to those markets. This something has to give and we think both sides will have to give. On the one hand side, projects will need to improve and are already improving their risk profiles. We see projects entering into corporate PPAs like Volkswagen in Mexico, we see Google in Chile with Acciona, we see Heineken in Egypt, so all these corporate PPAs are, are, are there to stay. We also see off-grid plants with mining off-takers uh, securing those cash flows, so projects are actually getting better and stacking up in order to attract more uh, investment and more financing. We also see on the other side, those liquidity holders, investors and lenders are actually taking more risk and will have to take even larger risks. So we, need, we think that, uh, that lenders will contemplate higher risk profiles than they are doing now in the post-crisis uh, world. We, we think that investors are already and will continue to, take, to absorb larger volumes of risk because competition and hunger of yield, for yield will, will will only exacerbate the, the current situation. When we talk about green bonds, we see the intermediation, we see new players come, we will see new players coming up. So if traditional players don't in, don't enhance the risk profiles, don't take more risk, then other people will do it. But that liquidity will get to the credit market and to the investment market, down to the solar PV sector, one way or another. That is for, for certain. And last but not least, we also see regulators and political authorities multiplying their support. We expect new forms of support as an evolution from feeding tariffs, like local governments offering 
price stability mechanisms, soft financing from richer countries under the COP21 agreement, or tax, tax incentives for carbon-free projects, or taxation on carbon projects. I mean, there's a number of political levers, political instruments that, that can be a play and that will be used, no doubt, in the coming years to support the sector. We also expect more of the existing monopolies to turn into competitive markets to attract part of that liquidity, like we have recently seen in Mexico, where CFE is no longer the only off-taker. They're creating a pool market now after the reform. and. Uh, of course, earlier examples are more likely to be seen in larger countries with uh, high energy prices, relatively deep and liquid debt markets, and established uh, local capital markets. Um, so our message is one of a very optimistic future. We think uh, the situation is as good as it gets, and every element is there for well-structured projects to find debt and uh, equity solutions. Thanks a lot, uh, Manuel. That's a very clear, in-depth overview with a very positive end, I would say. Um, a couple of questions came by during your presentation. Uh, one of them, uh, well, is a frequently asked question recently. It's about yield goes. And I'm curious if you, if you can share your vision about it. Uh, the question is, do you still believe that, uh, that, that yield goes will be coming up, uh, back up and uh, in an increasing interest rate environment? Um, because this makes yield goes potentially prohibitively expensive, especially in emerging markets. What are your thoughts? Well, we have seen yield goes attracting capital at four or five percent returns. That is the that is the background. I mean, we were there two years ago. Now they seem to have uh, fallen from grace, and uh, after um, you know a couple of. Um, very well-known collapses or near collapses by some of the uh, big uh, groups behind them. Um, I still think that there is, uh, there is, uh, you know, as far as my sight can see, uh, there is a very low interest rate scenario going forward. So I still see expansive monetary policy. So I still see liquidity getting, you know, gathering and, and you know, accumulating there. So our thought is that the pressure that liquidity will, will exert no matter one way or another will again bring yield costs to the market. Some lessons have been learned in the previous edition, previous issuances, but our opinion is that yield costs will be back at significantly uh, low rates that will make that they are certainly one of the vehicles that will be a new generation of yield costs, yes, but will be make, making available uh, more capital also for emerging markets. Definitely, yes. Curious, uh, Thierry, uh, if you agree with, with that statement from Manuel? Sure. Uh, well, uh, I think what uh, we'll see uh, uh, is uh, we, we won't raise one trillion dollars <laughs> with, uh, with uh, complicated fancy uh, tools. Uh, I think ultimately what will need to be done is to channel the uh, uh, institutional money, the pension fund money, which wants uh, simple long-term structures. And that uh, the listing component of yield goes is something that doesn't work well. Um, or we'd rather see something that looks like more bonds or, or, or assets can be that can be held for, for a long period of time. So, so ultimately, we think that the, the, the right financing tools for financing projects, uh, solar projects in emerging countries have yet to be designed. In interesting, uh, interesting comment, Jerry. So, so there is a lot to talk about in, in February on the event, you would say. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I have a couple more questions before wrapping up this, this webinar. Uh, one to you, Manuel. Um, um, there was a question more related to small and me medium projects uh, that was uh, the following. Uh, any experience um, with financing an, an IPP uh, of, of less than one megawatt solar projects with a PPA for uh, small and medium enterprises? And, and how, in the, such a case, do you address the off-taker risk? Um. Smaller projects typically have the issue of uh, not being basically not qualifying for project finance. The reason is that um, the cost of you know doing a project finance is not proportional to the size. 
basically it takes the same amount of work to finance a one megawatt project on a project finance basis than it would a hundred megawatt project. So that means that uh, lenders and uh, advisors and uh, equity investors tend to focus on larger projects because the amount of work is the same and you, and you make more money. Right. So if you are going to finance or if you're going to use project finance for smaller projects, you need to put them together. Uh, what we do is we finance them in portfolios. We deal with portfolios, uh, so we aggregate a number of, say, 50, 60 uh, megawatts in one deal, and we approach the banking markets or the lending markets or whatever market it is we're in uh, on an aggregate basis. What it ends up with is a portfolio approach where you get kind of uh, the portfolio effect in all regards because you get cross collateralization among projects. So you diversify the locations, you diversify technologies, and you diversify the grid risk. Now, as to offtake, in some countries, uh, these works, uh, these small projects benefit from uh, regulatory advantages, like in Chile, for example, the PMGDs, Pequeños Medios Generación Distribuida, they actually qualify for price stabilization mechanisms that are le legally implemented in Chile, and they uh, and they are easy to financeable. In other contexts, you will need uh, some. Today, still, you may need some some uh, revenue stabilization uh, mechanisms. Indeed, some other mar markets may un undertake um, variable parts of merger risks, though. So we'd have to look at, at, at what market specifically it is that that the person putting the question is thinking about. Thanks for uh, for a clear answer, Emmanuel. Um, a question to you, Cherry. I have a couple last questions. One is, uh, markets rates will drop with increasing solar and wind installation volumes, uh, like we've seen in, in Germany or, and are seeing currently. How do you address that issue? Market rates, you're talking about power, power, uh, power, power prices. Exactly. Power prices. Exactly. Uh, well, first, uh, the fact is that uh, not all countries have uh, fun well functioning power markets. That's the case of Chile, that's the case of Mexico, that's the case of uh, mostly Latin American countries. In the rest of the world, that's not the case. So you're you're really not talking about uh, market impact. Now, it's it is true that if you have let's take the extreme example, northern Chile, where you have collapsing uh, power prices precisely because you have more and more solar coming and 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 transmission not yet being uh, there to to, 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 to to evacuate some of that power itself. Um, the, the answer to that uh, is not uh, within solar to solve. It is a systemic answer. And the only way you can solve it long term is by finding customers who are willing to pay your price, uh, either not necessarily long term prices, but if you're finding uh, solutions that where you have uh, solar-based uh, energy offers. Solar is just one part of the equation. The whole idea, we have a very strong conviction, is that uh, competitive solar, solar being so cheap, etc., means that the pure play solar model is dead. That, that's a bit of a, uh, of a paradox, but the only way to uh, address the issue of falling prices, of which is going to get drastic, more drastic, uh, with more more solar coming into the grid in, in all these geographies, especially those that have well-functioning markets, is to uh, bundle uh, solar with something else, and, and most importantly, to serve it to end consumers. The days of the pure play solar IPP, then again, is, is are probably numbered. Thanks, uh, Jerry. Um, Manuel, a last question to, to you. Um, what will be your key takeaway uh, to share with the audience uh, before closing uh, this session? Basically, that uh, I think my final sentence is, is pretty, a pretty good summary of what the message we want to convey. Um, situation is there's a, there's a hell of a lot of liquidity looking for a home. Uh, there's a hell of a lot of a need in the in the solar sector. And those need those need to come together. There will be liquidity. Just be confident there will be debt and equity for projects that are well structured, even in markets that are unthinkable today, even in structures that are not that are not you know 
even foreseeable today, right? The pressure is high on the equity markets, the pressure is high in the credit markets, even in a post-crisis scenario, and something will have to give. Uh, so, you know, it's all about uh, finding the right structure, hybridating, as Thierry was just suggesting, with other technologies, looking for the right off-taker uh, who wants to buy a uh, solar curve instead of 24-7 power, or if you need to hybridate, then find the right solution for providing those 24-7, or, you know, but there are many ways of being creative at going around these issues. The important thing is that the project is professionally structured and that you understand what the, the credit markets and the equity markets are demanding and there are a very large number of solutions uh, already at hand and new solutions will emerge in the coming years to get your project off the ground. Thanks a lot. Uh, Jerry, um, your last quote, sentence, suggestion, key takeaway. Well, I think everyone should come to this conference. I mean, we're going to have very interesting debates, and uh, I'd say that things are moving so fast that uh, uh, we'll see plenty of uh, innovations, news, and other things in the next two months. And watch out for uh, the World Future Energy uh, <clears throat> Summit in, in Dubai, in uh, Abu Dhabi, in, uh, in, uh, in January to see more announcements that uh, I think will uh, strike the world. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, thanks, Manuel, as well. Um, yeah, thanks for, for, for the note, Jerry. Uh, I need look forward to meeting all of you uh, in uh, the conference, uh, at the conference in February. Just a quick note um, um, before you leave, um, the early bird rates end this Thursday, so please go to the website if you want to register and you're sure you're coming, just do it now because you'll benefit from a, from a discounted tariff. Uh, on top of that, uh, the recordings of this session will all be available, so should you miss have you missed part of it or you want to look back on it, we'll make, uh, make besides the slides, we also make the recordings available, so we will uh, share these with you soon. Um, furthermore, if you had specific qu questions that you still would like to address to one of the speakers, just send them to me, my email address is on the slide, and I will introduce you to the speakers so you can, uh, can get in touch with them. Uh, not all of you, please, but uh, <laughs> otherwise it's going to be an, a busy day tomorrow uh, addressing all your questions to the speakers. But uh, nevertheless, I want to thank you once more. Uh, of course, more topics and more depth in February. Uh, we'll focus also on more smaller projects. Off-grid is also a topic in, in the session, so it's not all about large-scale uh, finance uh, and, and solar projects. And yeah, we're going to be there with over 200, 250 delegates from all over the world um, talking about this one topic. So I hope really to, to meet you all there. Um, we want to contribute to this transition and uh, describe today. And on behalf of Solar Plaza and FMO, uh, we look forward to meeting you there in February and uh, continue the conversation. Uh, thanks again, and um, happy to get in touch. Uh, please uh, send me an email. <laughs>